So grace and peace to you all. I know that we were only gone to the Eastern Shore for one week of church in the outdoors, but it sure feels like there's been a change in the seasons, doesn't it? From the summer and the long days and maybe some travel and less routines, and now to the fall, school's back in session for those of us in school, and time to hit the books and to come back from vacation and to get into a groove. At least for a few months until the holidays, right? And we're trying something new for this year, the school year, I guess you could say, which is to follow a different lectionary than we have been using. Now, I realize that lectionary is one of those jargon-type words that ranks right up there with hermeneutics and pericope as being so specialized that by using it, you are declaring yourself to be a church nerd. Um, So lectionary is basically a list of Bible readings that churches follow. And the big one that most Catholic and ecumenical Christians go by is called the Revised Common Lectionary, which means you might go to one church and hear one sermon about a scripture's reading and then walk down to a different church and hear a different sermon about the same scripture reading. Everybody pretty much goes through the Bible together, uh, most of the Bible together on a three-year rotation. But this year we're going to try a new lectionary that from fall through spring, goes over the whole scope of the Bible, starting with Genesis today in September, and getting to the prophets in time for Advent, and then following Jesus' life and his death and resurrection by the time Easter rolls around with readings about the start of the new church in the time between Easter and Pentecost. Now, I love the Bible, but it is kind of a big book to get a handle on, especially for those of us who don't have a lot of experience with it. So my hope is that by using this narrative lectionary, as it's called, getting a sense of the big picture, getting a sense of the big sweep of the Bible will be a little easier. Which, if you can do that, makes it a lot easier to see what each smaller piece is about. So that is a really long explanation for something you might not have noticed if I hadn't pointed it out, right? So let's have a prayer, and then let's get into it. Let us pray. Gracious God, creator of the entire universe, creator of all that is and was and is to come, bless us with insight, with understanding, and ultimately with love. For you, for each other, and for this wonderful, complex, astounding world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, today we're starting at the very beginning, as in, the very first words of our reading are, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I'll admit that my personality is the kind who likes beginnings. I like the blank sheet of paper in the new notebook. I always love the first day of school when we learned, talked about what we're going to learn in the coming semester. So maybe it's not a surprise. I thought it would be fun to start a church. And our reading today does create an image of God laying everything out in such a beautiful and orderly way. I don't know if you noticed, but this passage, more so than some others that we read from time to time, is really designed as a liturgy, as something to be read responsibly. First this happens, and then this. Then God sees that it's good. Evening, morning, the first day. Pretty impressive to divide everything up so neatly into light and dark, skies and sea and land, birds and fish, land animals, and then people last as the finishing touch for God's creation. Creation's enjoyers and caretakers for all the good things that God has made. It's all very neat and straightforward and laid out like a bedspread on a neatly made bed. Except, I have a hard time reading this story and not thinking about the wonder and the beauty of God's creation as we currently know it now through all the scientific study that's gone on between the writing of Genesis Uh, several thousand years ago and today. The current story that we know with a mysterious Big Bang exploding into an infinite, vast universe with an infinite number of stars, many of which are gigantically huge in comparison to our own sun, which is itself gigantically huge compared to the Earth that we live on, which is itself gigantically huge compared to a single human being, and all of this, this massively huge, and the massively huge and the unpredictably quantum small, resting on a carefully balanced set of physical laws and properties that make our life possible. And all of it following the limitations of time, which 
is not necessarily a given when you do the math. So it doesn't take long to just sit there and be like, whoa, right? So what would the updated version of this liturgy be? And God said, let E equal MC squared. Let the force of gravity be weak enough to keep the sun from crashing into the earth, but strong enough to keep people from floating off. And think about the mysterious beginnings of life out of a soup of amino acids and the long, long history of life developing on this earth. This version of the beginning of the world isn't quite so orderly. It seems to rely on a lot more randomness or trial and error or just multiplying your opportunities for success. And it speaks to a style of creativity and creation on God's part that is very, very patient and willing to try lots of things and enjoy whatever comes out of that, whatever that might be. For example, naked mole rats. Or those fish that live so far down in the ocean that they have lost the ability to see. Or giraffes, or humans too, for that matter, who have managed to do some amazing and terrifying things in the relatively short time since we discovered civilization, not to mention the iPhone. But guess what? Slow and subtle may just be the way God likes to work most of the time. You might be going along about your business and a little nudge comes along. Hey, you should get that guy a sandwich. Or maybe when the Bible talks about loving your neighbor, it is literally talking about your neighbors. We've been working and worshiping together as a new church start for almost two years now. Our first worship service was on September 18th of 2011. In some ways, the start was very orderly. I like to think, maybe not, but we've got our founding, I'm saying this and then I'm like, was it? All right. But we've got our founding scripture verse, right? Act justly, love extravagantly, and walk humbly with God. And it lays things out pretty clearly as far as what we're about and what we're striving for on the big picture scale. And yet, the living out of those values of justice and community and spirituality The path to finding the way that we, these particular people, are going to do those things together as a body and individually as participants and members of that body, that has been a place where God's Holy Spirit has been working by nudges and patient prodding. We come together to welcome each other into God's presence. And we laugh and we talk and we eat together. And slowly we get to know one another a little better. Community. We learn about people in trouble and we find ways to help. Whether with a bag lunch, a bucket full of cleaning supplies, or a nationwide resolution by our national church. Justice. We sing together, we pray, we give our time, our talents, and our treasure. We read the Bible and share with each other the stories from our own lives that those Bible stories touch. Spirituality. And it's all these little things, the mysteries and the wonders, the beauty, and sometimes the unbelievable slowness. All these things together, blessed by God's Spirit, moving over the chaos and coaxing out a beautiful mosaic, a beautiful balance that is creating this thing called a new church. I am grateful to be a part of it. And I believe that if our hearts and our prayers are in it, And if we listen again and again for God's creative word speaking to us as we grow and develop as a community together, that we will see that it is good. Indeed, that it is very good. Thanks be to God. Amen.